Well, he's a legend in his own right, but Richard Clapton's contribution to Australian music isn't limited to what he's done on the stage. Yeah, behind the scenes, his work with NXS helped take them from pub rockers to music icons, while also kicking off a lifelong friendship. It was the early 80s when Richard Clapton first caught wind of In Excess. Born and raised as a rock and roller, Richard knew talent when he saw it. To me, they engendered the, the whole spirit of music, which is really just you play music not to be rich and famous, but because you love music. The band liked Richard's vibe and asked him to produce their cover of the classic 1966 song, The Loved One. Richard agreed, and the song went to number 20 on the Australian charts. Oh, baby, I love The successful collaboration led to Richard producing the band's second album, Underneath the Colours, released in 1982. But more importantly, the experience kick-started a bond between the artists, a bond that remains to this day. Good stuff, isn't it? Here to take a stroll down memory lane. Producer, musician Richard Clapton. Hi, Richard. How are hey. you? Good morning. Good morning. Now, legend has it that you first saw In Excess in a pub. Not at Woodstock. Not at Woodstock, <laughs> in a pub, a Sydney pub in front of, I don't know, a crowd of about nine people. True? It, well, well, to be brutally honest about it, it was actually nine local drunks. <laughs> and it was the only place they could get a drink in Paddo. Right. Around about that hour of night. But no, the, um, their manager really shall I use the word, coerced me into going down and seeing them at midnight. Mm -hmm. Offered you and free drinks? <laughs> he offered me free drinks. But when I got down there, was, I mean, there's virtually no one there. And I'd already been a professional musician for about 12 or 13 years at this stage. And what just blew me away, they came out and played with this passion and panache that I couldn't believe. I mean, playing to nobody like that. And then, and then I always followed this up with, then about 11 years later, I saw them at, playing at La Bercy in, in Paris to about 25,000 right. fanatical fans. Yeah. And it was still the same band. It's incredible. Uh, wow. Of course, there's the show now, The X Factor, but back mm -hmm. then it meant something mm -hmm. amazing, something that you couldn't actually define. What were you seeing in that pub in Pado with mm -hmm. nine drunks that made you think these guys are going for the world stage? Um, I think it was about the third or fourth song they did, which is a song called On a Bus. Um, and I don't know, something just clicked with me. Then after the gig, I went into their dressing room and, and we just hit it off. And so almost immediately it was decided that I'd, I'd produce the love one for them. And I'd never produced before, so it was pretty, pretty daunting to do that. But um, we went in and as, you, as they just said, we had a bit of a hit with it, so I went on and did their album. Bit of a hit? Yeah, under, underneath hit, the yeah. colours. Mm. What is it though that you think then, then came the, the cracking of the US market, which is, it's one thing mm -hmm. to have talent and, and to have mm -hmm. all this potential, but then to actually make it is a completely different thing altogether, isn't it? Why do you think they were so successful in cracking that US market? I believe it, it was like a number of catalysts that came together. Sure. Uh, but a lot of it was attitude. Um, there was more self-belief from that camp, that entire entourage that I've ever witnessed before, really? or since, mm. you know, just um, obsessively compulsive, really. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, it was just like, you know, they were just going to do it. Uh, we know a lot about the band, a great mm -hmm. piece of Aussie music history. Mm -hmm. We're going to know more come Sunday night. Mm -hmm. But in your mind, what, what don't we know? Could, about in excess? About in excess, because you've got to have a whole lot of secrets. We're <laughs> expecting you're not going to give it... Give it all. And but, I should but, tell it all on the morning show. No, no, no but what's, what's one, you know, you must have one really nice, juicy story that just makes you smile every time. Um, look, truly, there's so many of them. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I, I'm, I'm being a bit cagey here because I've got a book coming out in September. Oh, um, okay. and, if you want to be invited back to no, talk about I, the book. No, truly, I am trying to <laughs> self-edit. Just share self chapters edit. one through seven. For <laughs> mm -hmm. just, just, I'm trying to self-edit here. And, what and, were they and, like in the studio then? Tell us what they were like in the studio. When they were uh, for me, yeah. absolutely phenomenal. I'd never worked with guys like this. Like, as a collective bunch, they, they were, I mean, it, it was almost like six geniuses, almost. 
Mm. So, to be honest with you, it was, it was quite an easy job. Look, all I did was try and... They were very young and very green, and I just tried to show them how to make an album, because I'd already done about eight or nine albums right, of my own. Right, right, right. Um, but they really did the rest themselves. Of course, in pretty much everything we see in here, we, we, we have Michael out the front. Mm -hmm. Was he... Was he the leader? Because, as you say, there are a whole lot of geniuses in that room. Mm. No, no, it was a, it was a very democratic sort of band, right. you know. So I, I, I really don't believe any particular member was a, a leader. And, and Michael never, not, Michael never attempted to be, you know, um, the. the figurehead at all. Well, not at that stage, anyway. But what about this lack of confidence that we hear about with Michael Hutchins? Um, that was really in my day. Mm -hmm. um, now, the thing... Some, uh, one, one fact I think that people don't realise about Michael Hutchins is vocally, he's really into to the, the purest old blues singers, Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, and that was one thing Michael and I had in common. And that was who he sort of really wanted to emulate. But when I got him into the studio, like the first weekend I got him in, um, I made sure everyone else was banned from the building and there was just be Michael on the engineer and me. Wow. And I, to be frank, I didn't get anything out of him. And I was doing really weird stuff. Like, I had <laughs> microphone cables going about three rooms down. You know, Michael would be down there, down the end of the hall on his own. And, and I just couldn't get, get anything out of him. But then I finally, there was a studio in Woolloomooloo called Paradise. And um, there was there, what you call a live room with a lot of mirrors and glass and stuff. Right. And I got him in there and he was happy and he just did the whole album. So back bang, up a bang, bit, bang. why in that circumstance couldn't you get anything out of him? He just wasn't... He just what, wasn't didn't comfortable. Have a show? He didn't have a... I, like, I don't think he had a lot of confidence, self-confidence in those days. Right. And it, it, look, it, it just... I had to find the key, like the ambience and all that sort of stuff. Mm. You know, it, everything had to be right, just right for him. Okay. But, as I said, when I got him in the right environment, he just did the whole album, bang, bang, bang. Wow. When we say you were close to the band, mm -hmm. extremely close, you lived with John Farris for shared, shared a place. For most of the 80s, yeah. And, you know, Johnny and I have been all over the world and, you know, we've been over most of Europe and Canada and... Hmm. Blah blah blah. So there's, yeah, there's, we've had, it's been a pretty great ride. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, it's the blah 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 that we want to know about. Mm. Uh, and, and don't forget, Noel Rogers called Johnny the greatest white drummer in the world today. Yes. Did you know that? Yeah. Well, yes. See, mm. if, if you share a place with uh, with a drummer, that's a very brave. Isn't it? Like, if you know, if you, if you have a bedroom but the next thing to is, a drummer. Johnny's, Johnny's more an artist than a drummer. And I, okay. No, I'm being not being facetious. I'm being serious. He is more an artist than a drummer, because um, you know Johnny and I have co-written quite a bit over the years and stuff. And he's played. John's played on pretty much every album I've done since I, I first met him. So. <laughs> when did you know? Because we, we go back mm -hmm. to the first night in Paddo, nine mm -hmm. drunks, not really listening. When along that journey did you go, OK, these guys are going to be the biggest stars in the world? That night. No, really? I'm a that seer and a suicide. Pub. No, truly, something... It was, <laughs> it was kind of an epiphany, truly. I mean, I know that sounds a bit, a bit sort of far-fetched, but it was. You know, they got about halfway through their set and I just thought, these guys, I don't know, they've just got it. So, as a producer, in your mm. opinion, and this is just your opinion, mm. what do you think is In Excess's best album? Do you have a favourite? Uh, I'd have to say Kick, yeah. really. I mean, it's sort of it's sort of the consummate In Excess album, and it really, to me, that is In Excess, you know. But, I mean, you know, as I said, a consummate In Excess album. I love hearing you talk about this stuff, because clearly you're still passionate about it. You spark up, yeah. you light up when you're talking about it. Oh, yeah. So, it still brings you great joy today to look back across those, yeah. those fantastic, that, great years. Mm. Oh, it couldn't be better. Were you here in the 80s? No. Only just. Oh, what a deck. Oh, sure, Larry. Oh, Only sure. just. <laughs> a lot written, of yeah. course, about In Excess. Mm -hmm. Good and bad. Mm -hmm. Now we're about to see the Never Tear Us Apart mm -hmm. miniseries. Um, as a close mm -hmm. friend, is it difficult to watch part of those? Um, well, not really. I mean, I mean, look, to be honest with you, I haven't seen much uh, so far. Mm. Um, so I wouldn't know until I, you know, I've seen it. But to but, watch on and to see so much written, not not so much oh, yeah, oh, miniseries, right. but to, to watch all um, that play out in, in the media. As, sometimes, as you, yeah. yeah. I, I remember after Concert for Life, I used to get very frustrated with the Australian, the Australian media and even to some extent the Australian public, who just... I, I was going out there sort of crusading, uh, trying to explain to people that In Excess were actually the biggest band in the world, bigger than you two. Mm. Wow. And... and you know, after Concert for Life, they were being a bit denigrated, I suppose. Um, and I just thought, not only was it not good for the band, I don't think it was good for Australia. 
you know, Australia needed to recognise this band because it's part of our cultural heritage. Uh, where were you and how did you hear about Michael's death? Um, I was in a bookstore with my daughters and Michael Chug, Chuggy, who I think yes, you all know. Yes, a well-known promoter. Chuggy, yeah, yeah. Chuggy called me and um, my, my daughters were really little. They were only about nine or something. Mm. Uh, they're twins. Mm -hmm. And I, I was actually Dimmick's... Um, Oh, this goes in the state, doesn't it? Dimmick's sure. on George Street in Sydney. But anyway, no, Chuggy dropped the bombshell on me and, and um, obviously I thought it was a joke for the mm. first 30 seconds. Mm. Then he convinced me it was true and, and um, now it's kind of... I sort of burst into tears, which is rather embarrassing in front mm. of my little daughters because mm. yeah, they obviously sad. didn't understand. But it, it was a devastating shock to me. Mm. Richard, thank you so much for thank coming you. on the couch and mm -hmm. sharing your memories. The couch. Of... The couch. <laughs> yeah, that is. Yes. <laughs> it was a therapeutic for you. Thank you. <laughs> it was. Thanks, Richard. Great, thank great to see you. We so right. many kids. Thanks we... a lot. <laughs> Good we to see you. We love your insights, right. even yeah. though yeah. you didn't share chapters one through seven with us. Um, but we'll have to buy the book, right? Yes, you okay. will. Uh, and still a rock star wearing sunglasses <laughs> inside. Good oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Thanks, well, mate. We wouldn't recognise him. No. That's right. Thanks, mate. Thank you. All right, tomorrow, in excess week long special continues as we look at the women who played a part in the band's history. Yeah, well, we're joined by singer Samantha Jade, who plays Kylie Minogue in Seven's miniseries in excess, Never Tear Us Apart, which airs this Sunday night and continuing the week after. Interesting to get Samantha Jade's take on it. Yes, yeah. indeed. Well, just ahead, calls from...